welcome to uh, Mental Wellness, the Importance of Neuroprotective Factors, brought to you by NAMI Cook County North Suburban. We're glad you chose to spend this time with us tonight. I'm Dr. Christine Somerville, a mental health educator and director of programs at NAMI Cook County North Suburban. If you don't already know about NAMI, we are the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization providing public awareness, no cost support, and education programs online and in person so that people and their families affected by mental health conditions can build better lives. We are a lifeline to individuals and families who don't know what to expect in their difficult life journey. Our programs are free and open to all of those in our 17 community service area, but we actually don't turn anyone away who is in need. If you joined us for our September webinar, you'll recall that we discussed psychopharmaceutical medications and their side effects. Um, Dr. Shulman and Dr. Menendez were invited to that conversation. But when I spoke with Dr. Menendez, he offered to talk about something a little bit different, which I thought would be a great um, part two of this discussion. And uh, so tonight we will hear, at, um, hear about some other remedies for maintaining our mental wellness. And we will leave plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. But if you'd like to type some questions into the chat box or the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screen, feel free to do that at any time during the presentation, but we'll address them at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gerardo Rodriguez Menendez. He is a licensed psychologist in Florida, a board certified psychologist with the American Board of Professional Psychology and the president of the American Academy of Clinical Psychology. Apart from clinical psychology, he also has specialties in psychopharmacology, neuropsychology and pediatric psychology. Presently, Dr. Rodriguez is chair and professor of the clinical psychopharmacology department at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. He is the 2020 recipient of the Chicago School of Psychology's Dis Distinguished Research and Scholarship Award. And he is also the recipient of the American Psychological Association's Division 55 Award for Distinguished Contribution to the Advancement of Pharmacotherapy at the state level. He is bilingual and has published his research in both English and Spanish. It is my pleasure to welcome tonight, Dr. Gerardo Rodriguez Menendez. Thank you, Dr. Somerville and go. So the content, uh, first of all, thank you for, for that gracious uh, introduction, uh, Dr. Somerville. And for those of you uh, in the audience, uh, this is a, a particular uh, topic of great importance to overall well-being and, and how we feel in life. And so then we're going to discuss why wellness is really the foundation of health. Uh, as Dr. Somerville mentioned, neuroprotective factors end up being uh, extremely important, particularly as we go through the developmental process and into our senior years. Uh, what is wellness? And there are eight dimensions of uh, personal wellness that we, we will uh, go ahead and discuss and their importance. Uh, also how to cultivate different areas of, of wellness. Uh, the importance of managing stress. And I'm sure that uh, you have heard uh, other presenters on the importance of stress, but more and more research is indicating how uh, uh, critical it is to be able to manage stress in a healthy manner. So we'll be talking about that in today's presentation as well. And then defining a plan, a personal action plan to nurture personal wellness is certainly important. And then some wellness habits and routines. And then we'll go ahead and uh, have our question and answer session. So let's discuss a, a little bit about personal wellness. And typically when folks think about wellness, they're thinking more about 
absence of disease per se. Now, in today's environment, we are just accosted with all sorts of pressures and stresses. And part of the challenge today, and we can see this so clearly with COVID-19, is that life is not as usual. And for many of us, this has been a roller coaster of an experience. And business leaders often use the term VUCA. And what does VUCA exactly stand for? Well, the V stands for uh, volatile or unexpected, very unstable. We don't know how long certain situations or stressors are going to continue. Uncertain. We don't know, you know, how long this is going to go on. We don't know what is going to happen. Is it going to have a, a positive outcome? How are we going to be personally impacted um, by uh, these various stressors? How does it impact our family members and our friends? Complexity. We know that there are a lot of different moving parts, factors to consider, and it can be an overwhelming process, especially because one is looking out not just for oneself, but for one's family as well. And then ambiguous. There are no precedents. And the relationships between the, the factors that we are coming uh, to face we really do not have a very clear understanding of them. Uh, prior to COVID-19, very few people had heard of the word COVID, for example. And we know that this has had a huge impact with regards to uh, unemployment, with regards to health-related matters, uh, with regards to education, our families. So this is a very, very challenging time that we are experiencing. Consequently, health and vitality are key strategies that you can utilize. And certainly we have different states of health depending upon our age, but regardless of age, there's always something that, that I find that you can do to improve a dimension of health as uh, we'll be uh, discussing. And so then the change of pace is just so fast and the rules seem to be changing all the time as well. Social distancing, how close can we get, when to use a mask just as a function of COVID, but we also know that within our employment settings, we have a lot of uh, pressures and stresses as well. So you have increased workloads. It demands a lot of mental toughness, toughness high le levels of energy. And as I mentioned, the ability to manage stress effectively. We're going to talk a, a little bit more about stress management. Communication skills and interpersonal relationships are of key importance. And we'll be discussing also the principle of the three C's uh, in this presentation. How to engage in uh, good conflict management. Conflict is part of life. And so then even when we are with our families, we're going to be experiencing uh, levels of conflict. So how can we manage these situations uh, in a productive way, and then fostering what is referred to as a mindset, a growth mindset. So I'll be mentioning a little bit about the uh, research of Carol Dweck with regards to the importance of mindset for wellness. Now, when we talk about the traditional health model, and I'm sure you have heard this, ad nauseum, the biopsychosocial model. And this is a clinical model that is used in uh, mental health, but by definition, it is a disease model. And so then when we look at research that was written prior to 2000, uh, the overwhelming articles about psychological states and emotional states 
the great majority of articles, and I'm citing at least uh, 85 to 90 percent of articles, were on subjects such as depression, anxiety, uh, shame, fear. And so then uh, more than likely you have heard about positive psychology. I'm a very big believer in positive psychology, but then how does this translate into a new model of health and wellness? So as I mentioned, there are eight different um, models or, or excuse me, dimensions of wellness that go into actually the biopsychosocial model. So when we talk about bio, we're obviously talking about physical health and we'll mention some aspects related to physical health. When we're talking about psycho, so biopsycho, we're talking about psychological states. So really our intellectual health, our emotional health and our spiritual health in particular are extremely important. And then when we talk about social health, obviously socialization, but also occupational uh, aspects go into uh, that dimension of socialization. And then we have the environment because we want to leave the world a better place for um, those who come after us, for our grandchildren and our great grandchildren and for society in general. So our relationship with the environment has assumed greater and greater importance as well. And also this is a key aspect in terms of avoiding neurotoxins that are so commonly found in the environment as a result of contamination. Now, here's a question that I have uh, for the, the audience, and I'm not expecting, you know, oral responses, but just for you to consider the, the following. Of the factors included below, which one has the highest influence on our health status? So number one, is it human biology? Our environment, is it healthcare? or lifestyle choices. Now, I don't think that we have a polling option, but think about those four things and which do you believe has the greatest impact on our health status? Biology, environment, healthcare, having access to good healthcare or lifestyle choices. When we look at the top 10 causes of mortality in the United States, and uh, these figures have not changed significantly, we can see that almost all of them have behavioral correlates. So for example, heart disease, it's true that certain individuals are born with um, a heart abnormality, but generally speaking, Heart disease develops from a sedentary lifestyle, one in which uh, obesity is quite common. And there is a lifestyle that goes, uh, that, that is highly associated with the development of heart disease in, in later life. The same occurs with cancer. Uh, lower respiratory diseases, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, here, this goes with the lifestyle choice uh, as well, typically. Do we decide to, for example, smoke as, um, as one of our, our habits or routines? Uh, even accidents and unintentional injuries do have behavioral correlates. Some individuals tend to take more risks than others. And if you go to any emergency room in the United States, you'll find that Friday evenings are going to be about their busiest time of the week because people are free, it's the end of the week, and they engage in high-risk behaviors, whether it's substance use or whether it's trauma as a result of a motor vehicle accident. Uh, same thing occurs with stroke. 
even Alzheimer's disease. There are researchers in Loma Linda University who believe that about 50% of dementias are preventable. And uh, there's quite a, a bit of research now coming, uh, not just in the United States, but also with Europe, that indicates that um, cardiovascular health is of critical importance in the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, the incidence of Alzheimer's disease worldwide has gone down about 25% over the last 25, 30 years or so. And this has been an international finding. Same thing with diabetes in the sense that most individuals who develop diabetes will have a, a lifestyle choices and um, other types of uh, renal conditions are associated with lifestyle choices as well. So basically 51% of our health is determined by the uh, choices that we make in life. Now, just as there are negative choices such as smoking and obesity and you know, overeating and, and uh, alcohol or other substance use, there are also positive choices that one can make in life. So social science research emphasizes that health is not defined by the absence of illness, even mental illness, nor is it limited to feeling happy. Rather, wellness has to do with a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being. So it's not just the absence of disease, it's how balanced are we? So when we talked about those various dimensions, it's important to know that, you know, typically these areas or these dimensions of wellness are kind of like anchors in our lives. So uh, for example, friends and family, we are social beings and we need love. We need to give love and to receive love for our, our best development. So when we're looking at these various areas, what happens with folks is, and typically, is that we are not all well balanced. Most people tend to have some gray areas where they really need to spend more time. So for example, it might be in physical health and taking some time to do more exercise. It might have to do with socialization and, and you know, not being such a homebody, but getting out there, being active, and meeting with folks. It could be on a financial level that one feels imbalanced, meaning that too many expenses for the, the revenue that's being generated in, in the household. And so then uh, Freud said that we need two things. We need love and we need work, hopefully gainful work. But any one of these areas, most people are going to have, as I mentioned, they're not going to be, you know, completely developed in all of these various dimensions. Moreover, when something happens whereby we have a financial hit, followed by a major social hit, for example, divorce, followed by um, a, a diagnosis of, you know, some sort of physical um, uh, condition, might be high blood pressure. All of these things then can create uh, mental illness depending upon how well one is able to manage stress. And not just uh, mental illness, physical illness, uh, as we will discuss as well. So when we talk about the components of wellness, intellectual wellness is of key importance. And one of the things that we know about the brain is that the brain requires stimulation. The brain requires novelty. So it is in your best interest to continue to develop 
whatever skills you have. They can be, for example, in music, if you like to write poetry, you know, if you do certain things that you enjoy, uh, such as gardening, that is actually an aspect of mindfulness and intellectual wellness. If you like to do Sudoku puzzles, that's a great way to uh, keep the mind active. But whatever you do, have a commitment toward lifelong learning, continuing to learn as we grow, because you're going to be strengthening the synapses in different areas of the brains between the actual nerve cells themselves by engaging in, in these activities that stimulate the brain. If you have a particular passion, you know, definitely embrace that passion and help to develop and nurture those areas of yourself. When we talk about wellness as well, self-care becomes of uh, critical importance. So nurturing the mind is a great way to uh, seek wellness. So think of then what are those activities that you can engage in and what are those things that really, you know, create a, a passion for you or certainly intellectual curiosity. It might be learning another language, but whatever it is that you like, studying carpentry, engage in those types of habits and routines. Uh, you'll find that you'll feel better and that it's actually better for you. Social wellness, how we relate to the self and others. And as I said, we have basically relationships with the self and with family and friends. And then we have occupational relationships that are very in, important for our own well being. So, being able to be engaged then and to having meaningful relationships, both at home and at work, you know. There's a reason why um, the incidence of heart attack tends to be highest Monday morning around 7.30. If you do not like your work, it is of critical importance for you to find something that is meaningful for you that you can you know, have a good livelihood at and where you're feeling challenged. So it's also intellectual challenge, but you feel stimulated in that particular environment. So you um, want to have a great relationship with yourself, with your family and friends. We're gonna talk a little bit about how to nurture those particular relationships uh, with the self and with others, especially your family and, and uh, when you come home. Now, I like to say that there are three C's for high performance and for social relationships. These are congruence, connection, and contribution. When I talk about congruence, it is to accept and to love oneself. And it is to understand your areas of both strength and weakness as well. You know, in an empl employment interview, for example, or when I am um, meeting with a patient, I will, or a client, I will ask them what their strengths are. And invariably, individuals can quite easily tell you about their strengths. But then when you ask the person, okay, where do you really feel that you have some weaknesses? Many people, you know, might cite one or two weaknesses, but after that, they're, they're not, you know, uh, they, they tend to be a little bit more um, reserved in what they say. So it's very important for you to be aware of what those weaknesses are, because that's part of introspection, and that is part of personal insight. 
So when we talk about congruence, then we have this understanding of what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, what our past experiences were, and accepting ourselves as we are, loving ourselves, we have strengths, but even though we have those particular weaknesses. When I talk about congruence as well, I'm talking about mind-body congruence. So uh, we'll talk about the importance of centering oneself as part of wellness, but that's a very important aspect that mind and body are in one, they are in unison. Connection, we talk about family and friends, the connection with self certainly, but the connection with family and friends is of critical importance, our connection at work and having work that we feel is uh, productive for us. Uh, and as mentioned, that stimulates us because our work is part of our identity. And then contribution. At the end of the day, people who are happy, people who exhibit wellness, seek to contribute to a greater good than just themselves. And so then, they have empathy for the human condition and for others, and they seek to improve the uh, human condition. And that has to do with contribution. So for reflection then, what activities can we engage in that will cultivate and strengthen our social well being. You know, and some folks tend to be a little bit more reserved and um, do not like to socialize as much, but research is pretty clear that if you socialize, if you have an active social life, number one, it's a neuroprotective factor because folks who, for example, develop dementia. Um, a key finding is that they tend to be socially isolated. So they don't have those social relationships. And when we talk about neuroprotective factors, the one thing that I really want you to understand is that the brain is constantly changing. There was a time when we used to think that the brain was fairly stagnant. You know, you're born with 100 billion neurons or so, and you develop them by adulthood, and that was pretty much it. We know now that the concept of neuroplasticity is very important, and that disease can become manifest or not manifest, depending upon that interaction between our uh, genetics and our environment. What is happening to impact uh, our brain functioning. Emotional wellness. And often people do not give sufficient um, attention to emotional wellness, but our emotions are very deep seated. And in fact, um, found in primitive areas of the brain. And so then um, before we were able to communicate, meaning uh, modern human beings, before we used language to communicate, we hadn't developed language. So how would we communicate with other human beings? Well, chances are grunting, Facial gestures was very important. And then the, our emotional systems are very in touch with our own survival as well. And we're going to talk about this a little bit in depth, depth when we talk about our responses to uh, stress and what happens if we have excessive levels of, the stre of stress impinging upon us. So emotional wellness, I, I like to say that you have a, an emotional regulatory system. And often people are so disconnected from their emotions that then they feel anxiety or they feel depression. 
So anxiety and depression can actually be good in the sense that they're letting you know or can be letting you know something is not right in, in our lives. I need to pay attention to, to something. I don't know quite what it is, but I've got to, you know, there might be something that, that I need to, to examine more, more carefully. So then what is our stress response? And common question, can stress kill you? Hans uh, Selye said, it's not stress that kills us, but our reaction to stress that kills us. So that's very true. And there are neural components of emotions. And so then uh, we talk about the limbic system and the limbic system is a more primitive area of the brain, very important for emotional regulation. It's uh, an emotional center. And the, um, the prefrontal cortex or the frontal lobes of the brain are very important in terms of being able to um, help to modulate that emotional uh, state, that internal emotional state, so that it will be more socially accepted to other individuals, such as uh, in um, families and friends and, and at work through socialization. But there are two other systems that are working here that are very important. The autonomic nervous system is of critical importance because this is going to be predominantly your sympathetic nervous system that is going to be overactivated. Short term, that's great. You know, this is for survivability. So if you meet a real threat, it could be um, a large animal, you know, that appears threatening or even another human being or a situation, you know, that is threatening, a uh, hurricane, whatever the case might be, your sympathetic nervous system is gonna immediately kick in. And what it's going to cause is for adrenaline and noradrenaline to uh, be released into the body so that you can prepare your muscles and your, your heart and lungs for that fight or flight response that is so necessary for our survival. A slower system is the endocrine system, but here is where you have um, the, and sometimes you might've heard of this, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access. And so then here is where we're getting a release of cortisol, which is also a, in fact, called the stress hormone, preparing us for extended stress. However, although in the short run, this is very adaptive and also uh, part of survivability, in the long run, it is very harmful to our mental and physical well-being. So the elements of psychological stress, you have a stimulus or some sort of threatening event, you have thought followed by emotion typically that's associated, and then we have behavior, right? We act on our thoughts and our uh, emotions, and then there is an outcome uh, as a response to that particular behavior. So what we have to do is to be able to control the stress reaction by interrupting and changing the way that we perceive the event. Now, again, if it's a, high, if it's a true threat, you've got to trust your body and let your mind follow the body. But if it is stress that we are producing and creating in our own minds, then that is the type of stress that we must learn how to better regulate. So I like to say event plus response equals outcome. 
So we cannot control the event. And we know that bad things happen to good people. So we can't control the event, but what we can control is our response to that event. And so then that combination of what is the event, what is our response, invariably produces the outcome. Now, when I was talking about chronic stress, short, you know, you, we all need a little bit of stress because if not, we wouldn't get up in the morning, we wouldn't go to work, we wouldn't get tasks done that need to be done that have implications for ourselves or our families. However, when you have excessive love, and that's what I'm referring to, a little bit of stress, we're too relaxed, we're, we're not motivated. We have the sweet spot, if you know, you know, golf, for example, right? So if you have that sweet spot, you have a moderate level of stress, you typically do quite well with that, okay? It's when stress becomes excessive that we tend to have a lot of difficulties. And over a period of time, it causes what's referred to as central nervous system deregulation. So what are some of the aspects that can happen? Inhibition of immunological functioning. And today there's actually a field called psychoneuroimmunology, looking at the impact of stress on immunological functioning. We can, it can impact our emotions. We can develop depression, weight gain or weight loss conversely elevated blood pressure, because again, you've got, you know, too much stress hormones going and causing increases of blood pressure. And over a period of time, it weakens the arteries and capillaries, gastric ulcers, low sexual desire, anxiety, acceleration of the aging process. And this is one of the things that we want to discuss when we talk about neuroprotective factors as well. So we're, we're going to be talking uh, about how to slow down that aging process. Uh, heart problems and disease, diabetes, stress can also interfere with memory. And it's thought that it, it can actually have an adverse effect on um, a structure in the brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, is of vital importance for memory consolidation. And then uh, difficulties with regards to conceiving as well. So uh, young couples experiencing too much stress will have difficulty uh, procreating. Okay, so let's talk about some effective stress management strategies then for home and office. Okay, so number one, you need to know what your demons are. What is producing the major sources of stress in your life? And you need to take account of this. Relaxation techniques are a great way to combat stress. When I speak of relaxation techniques, I'm not talking about coming home, propping your feet up on an ottoman, popping open a beer and watching TV. That is referred to as vegetation, mental vegetation. What you really want to do is to produce a physiological state of relaxation in the body. So when we talk about uh, mindfulness, it has a lot to do with proper relaxation. Muscle relaxation is key. So knowing what muscles are tensing up in our bodies, and probably a lot of you know that stress can cause anxiety, depression, and pain can be part of that clinical picture. Um, we can do breathing exercises. Do what you find. You've got to find out what works for you. You know, before I understand that you were taking a uh, presentation on pharmacotherapy, and we know that all SSRIs are not the same. 
all antipsychotic medications or anxiolytic medications are not the same. Some medications work better for certain individuals than for others. So it's always a, a manner of, you know, really trying to titrate and find out what is the uh, dosage that is needed, the least amount of the uh, medication, as long as it produces the desired treatment effect. So uh, breathing exercises can be a great way for you to de-stress because what you're also doing is that you're lowering your brainwave pattern when you are uh, relaxing. So when you're in a thinking state, you know, you've got thoughts going on all the time. And so then again, it's overstimulation. And on an EEG, you would see that you're in what's referred to as a beta state. What you want to do is that you want to get those brain waves down more to an alpha state, which is a, a state that uh, precedes um, feeling sleepy. So you don't want to feel sleepy, but you want to feel relaxed enough that you get the muscle relaxation and the mental relaxation as well. Okay, so getting um, an adequate amount of sleep. You're not going to feel well if you get five hours of sleep a night and people say, oh no, I have got high energy and the like, but most of us need about seven to eight hours of sleep. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about mindfulness and meditation as ways in which you can uh, combat stress. And then emotional intelligence. Very important concept, especially since 2000, you see more and more literature talking about emotional intelligence. Taking a break when you need to, and very, very importantly, exercise. I cannot stress the importance of exercise sufficiently. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in this presentation. Connecting with others. Remember that a disease state, you have a contraction, right? Whereas in an open state, you're going to have relaxation, you're going to have flow. You need to have that connection with others as opposed to becoming socially isolated. And obviously meaningful relationships is key. Learning how to manage your time. A lot of people feel stressed because they don't know proper time management just the same way that you manage your budget. You must manage your time. There are 168 hours in a week. So make the best use of that particular time. Ensure that you've got time for your family, but also time for yourself to nurture yourself. Cultivate your dimensions of wellness, as we've mentioned earlier. And any time that you feel the need, seek help. You know, uh, all Olympic athletes, I can assure you are going to have something in common and that's that they have a coach. And uh, coaches can be very beneficial when they have uh, the proper educational background and qualifications uh, for personal coaching. And then there is always counseling and, and psychotherapy. Okay, so here's another question for the group. Research supports that the most effective stress management method for physical and brain health is, is it number one, exercise and diet, number two, relaxation techniques and sleep, number three, taking a break from the stressors, Number four, exercise and meditation. Number five, connecting with others. Okay, so which do you think it is? Exercise and diet, relaxation techniques and sleep, taking a break from stressors, exercise and meditation, or connecting with others. 
If you chose exercise, you are certainly correct. And the correct answer is exercise and meditation. And I'm going to tell you uh, the reasons for that uh, at this juncture. Now, if you're kind of like me, you know, before I started really getting into this research and I had the desire to do exercise, I would just lie down, I'd wait till it passed, and then I'd get up again. But we are animals and we're meant to be running, we're meant to be walking, we're meant to, you know, to be climbing and swimming on a daily basis. And so then we have to take care of that body and we can't just think of ourselves in terms of, you know, our cognitive state. So um, one of the things that I teach my students to do is to prescribe exercise. And the key here is four days a week. And here it says 30 minutes. I would recommend that you get it to 40 to 45 minutes of sustained exercise. Now, I wanna mention something to you very clearly. If you, you know, I'll see people walking around a building, you know, during the day, that's great, you know, and I think that it is better than nothing. But if you really want to uh, take advantage of exercise, you must break sweat and you must raise your heart rate. That's what you've got to do. And the older you get, um, doing a little bit of light weights can help with the musculoskeletal system. But you've got to do exercise. Swimming is one of the best exercises on the planet. By the way, I will also mention to you that bar none, exercise is the best medication you can possibly take. And, you know, when we were talking about lifestyle choices and becoming sedentary, that's what leads to pre-diabetes and then to diabetes. And so then one of the best things that you can do is to exercise. I like to say that the best doctor I ever had was not my physician, but actually my martial arts sensei, you know, because um, working out there, you lose 30 pounds that's what you need to do. You've got to get your body within a uh, reasonable parameter given your height and weight. And you'll see that it'll have a tremendous effect on uh, your cholesterol levels and your triglyceride levels and the like. So exercise really is one of the best medica medi uh, medications that you can take. And in fact, even for your mental health, uh, if a person has uh, mild to moderate depression, exercise is as good or better than taking a medication. Okay, so physical wellness, then taking care of your body uh, for your overall health to ensure that you have proper strength and flexibility and cardiovascular endurance. Key importance. All right. I wanted to mention this as well, because there are certain medications, and I know that this is NAMI, uh, there are certain medications that can um, foster what is referred to as metabolic syndrome. That's defined by three or more of the following. And, and incidentally, we know that cert, you know, second generation antipsychotics have certain advantages over first generation antipsychotics, in particular, um, uh, extra pyramidal uh, symptoms tend to be far better controlled with second generation antipsychotics. However, these medications can also be associated with weight gain, which is why you want to understand a little bit about metabolic syndrome. So it's defined by three or more of the following waist circumference in males greater than uh, 40 inches in females. I can't see my slide, but it looks like 35 inches. Fasting glucose, uh, you know that your physician will ask you to uh, fast uh, before your blood work. If your uh, glucose level exceeds 100 um, milligrams per deciliter, then that is an indication of prediabetes, which is 100 to 105 milligrams per deciliter 
um, that glucose is measured. Greater than 126 on two separate testing dates, then typically, you know, that person would be diagnosed with diabetes. Uh, blood pressure that is elevated beyond 130 over 85, and then uh, high density cholesterol in males, uh, 40 milligrams uh, per deciliter, uh, less than, and in females, less than 50 milligrams uh, per deciliter. So you know that your high density cholesterol, you want that to elevate it and to decrease your low density cholesterol. So when we mention, uh, measure body mass index, this is a person's weight in kilograms divided by the individuals, uh, by the square of their height in meters. And a high BMI can be a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Now you have folks with high BMI and they are completely healthy, but generally speaking, it is an indicator of risk for cardiovascular disease. High blood pressure is the number one risk factor for stroke. And stroke is the leading cause of disability in the United States for persons over the age of about 50. So very, very important. And you can very easily measure your BMI. All you need to do is uh, just go to the computer, you know, uh, go to the internet and in your uh, Google or Foxfire search engine, uh, just look up BMI and uh, it'll even calculate it for you. The BMI underweight, if it is less than 18.5, normal is between 18.5 to 24.9. Overweight, this is of concern 25 to 29.9 and obesity is defined a BMI of 30 or greater. Incidentally, uh, research, there has been some uh, difference of opinion, but generally speaking, the consensus of research in the last, oh, five, seven years is that in patients with uh, schizophrenia, we really, who are taking second generation antipsychotics, we really need to look at preventing metabolic disorder. So as soon as we see that there's some elevation in blood pressure, some elevation in uh, weight, that should be a clear indication of, hey, we, we need to take a, a more serious look at this because it's associated also with a, a lower life expectancy. Okay, and then when we were talking about neuroprotective factors, meditation, you might not have heard of Elizabeth Blackburn, but Elizabeth Blackburn received the Nobel Prize in 2009. And the category is called physiology or medicine. And she found something of real importance. And that's that you, you know that our DNA is comprised of, our uh, chromosomes are comprised of DNA. And that uh, our chromosomes basically um, that's the, the blueprint for uh, human beings. We are 99.9% .9 genetically identical. It's that 0.1% difference where we see all of these differences with regards to physical appearance and the like. But at the ends of our chromosomes are these little caps and they're called telomeres. The thickness of the telomere can be measured. And there are other areas, uh, for example, volumetric analysis in the brain where we can measure certain structures of the brain such as um, uh, the hippocampus that I had mentioned earlier. But telomeres, we're talking about measuring this on human chromosomes. And the uh, thickness of the telomere varies as a function of stress it varies as a function of wellness. The thicker the telomere, the greater the chance of cellular division, the greater the probability that you will have continued cellular division. You know that at this time in life, you know, once you're past the age of say 35, we have more 
cells that are dying than are being regenerated. So we want those cells to continue being regenerated, right? So stress can have an impact the way that we perceive stress in terms of telomere thickness and cellular division. Blackburn in her research has noted the importance of mindfulness and mindful attention as being one of the ways that we can combat uh, stress and improve wellness. And she has quite a number of publications on this. By the way, uh, these publications have come out, for example, of uh, UCLA Medical Center. So when we're talking about spiritual wellness then, and we're talking about that ability to truly relax, meditation is a great way, or breathing exercises. Now, mind you, there are different ways in which you can do this. So mindfulness, as I mentioned, Folks who get into poetry, they're being mindful. If they're into creative writing, they are being mindful. If they're into gardening, they can be very mindful. So there are different applications of mindfulness. But what we are talking about is focused attention and being present. Human beings, to our knowledge, are the only individuals, or excuse me, the only species in life where we can project ourselves forward, we can project ourselves into the past. You know, Mark Twain said, I've, I'm an old man and I've known um, many woes, but most of them never happened because our minds are so powerful that we can, we're constantly looking at what, you know, potential consequences there are. How can this story end differently? So we need to be able to focus on the here and now. Now, previously, when we would talk about things like mindfulness, we were looking at, you know, some guy in India, uh, some mystic on a mountain. But I assure you that there is a science of mindfulness and a science of meditation in particular Personally, I recommend Zen meditation because there is no chanting in Zen meditation. Rather, it is um, a um, sustained uh, concentration done in silence. So here you see on Time Magazine, see a young woman engaged in meditation. I'm sure that members of the audience have also engaged in meditation uh, as well. But there are three core aspects to uh, meditation. The first of these has to do with uh, posture. Then we have breathing. And then we have mental focus, per se. Concentration. Some people like moving meditation. And here you have a slowness, slowness of movement, circularity in movement and co coordinated movements of the hands and feet so that they arrive at the same time. This takes a teacher and it takes, you know, you've got to go to class in order to learn Tai Chi. But to meditate, you do not need to go to, you know, a, a particular class unless you enjoy meditating with groups of individuals and you'll find meditation sessions for this purpose. But regarding Tai Chi, if 200 million people have been doing it in China for generations, I assure you that there are a lot of benefits to this, in particular, your posture and your balance, in addition to mindfulness and breathing. So when we talk about mindfulness, we mean mind like water. That is a proverb, because if you look at a calm body of water, you will see your reflection. A thought is like a pebble and dropping it into that calm body of water, you will see a distortion. You'll see ripples. Thoughts are the same way in moments of mindfulness. So when we are trying to pay attention and to focus on a given aspect, it could be on our breathing, for example, it's natural to have thoughts, but we want 
to try to reduce the number of thoughts so that our perception is clearer. In other words, we want to reduce the number of times that that rock is hitting that calm body of water that's producing our, our reflection. So that's a, a way to look at mindfulness. And when they have done studies, for example, at Harvard um, on uh, folks who meditate, they find that there is a thickening of uh, the brain tissue that is in the prefrontal areas of the prefrontal cortex. And it's not that more nerve cells are being generated, but rather the connections or the synapses are being strengthened, okay? So the pathway is being strengthened, hence increased brain volume as a result. So the ability to be in that present moment, not to be in the future, not to be in the past, to be engaged in what we are doing completely. And that is a key aspect of mindfulness. Okay, and then we have um, our occupational wellness, profession and career. And I know that we're coming to the end of our time. So I'll just say about this, find work that you find in, uh, that is challenging to you, but where you feel that you're making a contribution and that you feel that you're growing as an individual. One of the, uh, the more recent strategy or, or theories regarding physical and mental illness has to do with this concept of stress to the extent that scientifically the term is excitotoxicity. Nerve cells, the building blocks of the brain are very sensitive to increases in sodium, but particularly calcium. And when you have a massive influx of calcium, those nerve cells are going to fire. The more times that they fire and that they're being stimulated, the greater the likelihood they will continue firing. But in the same way that we talked about cortisol and its effect on arteries, for example, that you know, you've got an elevated blood pressure and so then you know, you've got this constant pounding going on in your arteries and your capillaries. So then what happens is that over time, your arteries and capillaries weaken, right? It makes it more prone to leakage, for example, to hemorrhage. The same thing occurs in the brain only with excitotoxicity. So if the brain is overstimulated, you can have a seizure, right? So if all of a sudden you have uncontrolled brain activity going on and discharges going on, an individual will suffer an epileptic seizure. So it's not at that level to produce a seizure per se, but it's at a lower level, but constant over a period of time. And as I said, this is central nervous system dysregulation. So work is a critical aspect of our lives. We spend more time, more waking hours with our coworkers than we do our own families. So consequently, it's important that work be a productive and stimulating area for us. At work with emotional intelligence, we've discussed this, but self-awareness, self-regulation, are of key importance. And there is what's referred to as McLean's triune brain theory. This is an old theory from the 1960s. There is some truth to it, but it's a good conceptual model because what it postulates is that you really have three brains. You have a very primitive reptilian brain. Then you have in the area that you see blue, an intermediate area, that we would call the paleomammalian brain. And then you see the green area, the executive state, the prefrontal lobes, and we would call this the neomammalian brain. So they sit on top of one another and emotional discharges occur from that limbic system, that blue area, and also 
the red area because the red area, your reptilian brain is more involved with survival states, keeping you know, your blood pumping, uh, being able to breathe. So anything that threatens our emotions is going to also threaten our survival state. So it's of critical importance to develop good conflict management strategies and good self-awareness and in particular self-regulation. So here we see that prefrontal cortex and we see empathy and insight and regulation and morality and the limbic brain, you know, am I safe, you know, and emotional outbursts continuously. Then financial wellness, we have to have financial wellness if we're going to be happy in life and finances are very clear stressors on individuals that can impact uh, how they feel about themselves. Um, so consequently, finances is also an, a, a dimension to wellness. And then lastly, we mentioned environmental wellness. That connection with our community, with our environment, and caring for one another through uh, just good, uh, being a, a good community citizen. Okay. I'm going to pass this up very quickly, and I'm just going to talk lastly about disengaging from work to enjoy life, because I think that this is one of the key things that you can take with you, exercise, neuroprotective factors, the importance of meditation, the importance of wellness, but transitioning from work to home. Now, fortunately, a lot of you probably work online as a result of COVID-19, but I'm certain that many of you uh, still go in and uh, work or, or are in the process of returning to work. So what are some things that you can do to transition from uh, work to home? The biggest mistake I see individuals making is that they get in their car or if they're using public transportation and they're still thinking of work. Okay, so before you leave work per se, or even if it's at home, before you end the day, look at your calendar. What do I have tomorrow? So that you already are preparing yourself tomorrow. What are, you, you can take a, a moment of reflection. What are some things that I accomplished today? And what are a few priorities that I need to look at for tomorrow? In this way, you're prepared for the next day. Now, once you leave work, your mind, I want it to be on your family, on enjoying your family. You know, uh, you can listen certainly to an audio book or relaxing, but the key thing is to disengage from work. Because what happens is that if you're still thinking of work while you're driving home or in, in route uh, home, then when you open the door, you can't just turn it off like a light switch. You have to prepare your body. The same way that you prepare your body to exercise, you begin with some light stretches, right? You just don't jump in to exercise. The same way you've got to prepare your mind and your body for greeting your family, for being home and being mindful of your family and loved ones. So, you know, upon arrival, that, you know, your family is you know, what I'm sure the great majority of you would say, it's why you work. So you want to, you know, look for a little bit of ways where you can spend, you know, after you have engaged with family with something for yourself, because again, you want to nurture the self. I do it early in the morning. I do it when my family goes to bed but I always take time to nurture myself. One of my favorite quotes is Michelangelo who said at the end of his life, I am still learning, okay? So if you need to dim lights, have dinner with your family. I cannot emphasize that, the importance of that. Put the phones away, you know, you shouldn't be on the phone if you wanna be connected with your loved ones. 
And then this transition, transition must be done deliberately and with intention. Now, I think that we've come to our, uh, there, I have some suggestions for you for the evening routine, but I just wanted to go ahead and moving, move into the questions in case anyone wanted to ask a particular uh, question or make a particular comment. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. That was certainly packed with a lot of nuggets of good advice and information and research. And um, I wanna thank you for all of that. Um, a couple of people have asked if the PowerPoint can be made available. Absolutely. Okay, so maybe you can- um, um, Send it to you. Send it to me and then I can reach out to those, those, can, those individuals who have requested it can reach out to me at NAMI CCNS. Um, so we have someone saying best presenter ever. <laughs> oh my Lord, well. <laughs> Look at that. Um, let me just go through some of these Their comments Their nose here. is growing. <laughs> Let me go through some of the comments. Um, yeah, will PowerPoint presentation be provided? You will make it available. Yes. Um, Janice says she loved the analogy of the Olympic athletes working with the coach versus mental health coaching. Thank you for that. Um, so Pamela says, you know, she said you were the best presenter ever and she, wish that um, you'd been one of her grad student professors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, somebody else said ditto to that. <laughs> you know, I, I have to say too, that as I was sitting here listening to you, you have such a, a calming, you know, relaxing way of presenting um, really serious and complex information that it didn't it didn't feel stressful in any way with that research on the brain and all of that. So um, I have to agree that you're 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 a great presenter. Um, someone That's is very kind offering their email for the presentation when it's available. Great information, Norma says. Great information. Thank you for the for the powerful presentation. Very well organized and knowledgeable. Um, information I can use now. We're getting a lot of accolades, no questions right now. Let me go to Q&A and see if there's any questions there. Um, again, will the PowerPoint be made available? Can I get a copy of the presentation? Um, wonderful, compassionate doctor. Um, and that's what we have right now. So we still have a few minutes left. So I'm gonna just, um, Suggest that if folks want to ask some questions, we do we do appreciate the accolades. I I concur a hundred percent. But if you have any questions, this was so thorough. I mean, I think some of some of the information, um, you know, it has to kind of settle in. For me, it has to settle in for to come up with a meaningful question. Bill says this was detailed and in common language, very informative. Um, Janice agrees that um, you had a very have a very calming way of presenting information. Um, all right, so any questions before we close? I'm going to ask you, um, Dr. Rodriguez, to stop sharing your screen. Certainly. Um, so that will allow me to, to also share um, some information before we close. Um, Kara asks, how many minutes should one meditate each day? That's a great question. Um, at the beginning, 10 minutes in the morning, and if you can, 10 minutes in the evening. So a total of 20 minutes. And you'll find actually benefit when you do this. Now, if you are stressed, for example, at work, you can just sit in a straight posture. Uh, as long as your back is erect, you don't want the back to be slouched. So you wanna be sitting erect. And you can just take a few moments just to breathe 
You'll breathe in through the nose and simply exhale through the mouth. Always exhalation should be longer than inhalation, at least as long or longer for the exhalation. Okay, because you don't want to uh, find that you're hyperventilating. So the, the breathing should be very natural, inhalation, exhalation, just do it a few times at work, you'll find that it actually makes a difference. And there's a whole series of breathing exercises that you can actually uh, do to combine, coordinate hand movement with breathing movements as well. Um, so Sylvia asks, how do you feel regarding schizoaffective disorder and potent meds in a patient with childhood trauma? I, um, that is a, a very complex question. Um, what is very interesting here is the fact that when you have childhood trauma, you know, in the literature, you'll, you'll find the term ACE, um, adverse childhood events. And so then there are different types of adverse child uh, events that one can have. It could either be due to, for example, child maltreatment, or they could be related to some uh, type of home dysfunction. So for example, substance abuse or um, neglect because a parent has a mental illness and cannot uh, properly take care of a child. But the earlier it occurs during childhood and the greater the number of repeated traumas, these can be different types of, of traumas, but the earlier it occurs, the greater the chance of even having a multiplicity of trauma. And there's a huge difference in a child between say the ages of one and six versus a child six and 12. Okay, so the later that the trauma occurs, the better the, the prognosis. And this is why we were talking about this very delicate relationship between our genetics and between the environment. So for example, you can have two individuals who are monozygotic twins, one may develop schizophrenia, but the other does not. And so then we have to ask ourselves, why did one twin develop schizophrenia and the other did not when they are genetically uh, uh, twins? So that is you know, one of those enigmas that we have. And that's why what we do wanna foster are productive health related and wellness types of behaviors. All right, um, I think that is the end of the questions. I wanna thank you again, Dr. Rodriguez for a wonderful presentation. Um, we will look forward to getting your your PowerPoint and sharing them. Absolutely. But it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. I, I felt right at home uh, with the NAMI group there in Chicago. My very best to you. And thank you, Dr. Somerville. I hope you will come back and talk to us again. <laughs> Be delighted. Thank you. So um, thank you, audience. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We're glad that you could spend part of your night with us. And we look forward to seeing you again. Um, in the near future. And until then, let me just say, stay safe, take care of yourselves and each other, and have a good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. <laughs>